This is the second in a series of videos on key scenes from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, aimed at helping you think and work more independently about ideas, characters, language and themes within the play. Don't just listen and nod. Answer the questions, make notes or annotate your texts. This will invariably result in a deeper understanding of the play. So stay tuned, let's study Act 1, Scenes 3 to 4 from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. A reminder that you need to have read Act 1, Scenes 3 to 4 before watching this video. If you haven't, stop watching now and go away and do so. Time for my brief summary of the two scenes. First, Act 1, Scene 3. We meet Olivia's gentlewoman, Mariah, the fun-loving but ultimately rather nasty Sir Toby Belch, and the foolish fop Sir Andrew Agercheek. Mariah warns Sir Toby that Olivia is getting increasingly fed up with his drinking and behaviour. Before making a fool out of Sir Andrew, who, like Orsino, wants to marry Olivia. Sir Andrew is persuaded not to give up on this quest and decides to stay in Illyria with Sir Toby. Now for Act 1, Scene 4, we return to Viola and see that she has made enormous progress within the stage time of around five minutes. She is not only successfully disguised as Cesario, but already a firm favourite of the Duke Orsino. So much so that he decides to axe previous messenger Valentine and send the new boy to try to win Olivia's heart on his behalf. However, the final couplet of the scene reveals the unfortunate fact that Viola has already fallen in love with Orsino. Time now for you to look at these scenes in more detail. Some questions are about to appear on screen. Read these through now, grab your pen and aim to write some reasonably detailed answers, including quotations if possible. This video will resume in five seconds time, so press pause now to get started. Question one, how does Mariah get the better of Sir Andrew? You could divide this question into three different parts or steps, which are shown on screen now. Let's go into further detail with each step. It is clear almost immediately after Sir Andrew has entered that he's not very bright and that he frequently ends up echoing hopefully what Sir Toby says without understanding its full meaning. Here's the most obvious example of this. Sir Toby instructs his apparent friend to greet Mariah in a virile strongman manner. However, he uses a verb, a cost, that Sir Andrew doesn't know the meaning of, resulting in the humorous but erroneous implantation of this verb into Mariah's name, and the first of many laughs at this poor man's expense. Step 2. When Sir Andrew asks, fair lady, do you think you have fools in hand? He is trying to do two things. A. Ally himself strategically with the obviously more adroit Sir Toby, as seen in the pluralisation of fools, and B. Indignantly knock back any accusation about his own insufficiency as a witty individual. However, Mariah twists the non-literal phrase in hand, meaning in this context something like around you, to the literal meaning of hand, i.e. a part of the body. Thus, when she says, Sir, I have not you by the hand, she is implying indirectly that he, and incidentally not Sir Toby, is a fool. Step 3. This time, Sir Andrew uses the literal meaning of the word, which Mariah adapts for her purposes. On screen, you can see Sir Andrew once again indignant and ridiculously behind the pace, as he explains that when it's raining, he can make sure that he has a dry hand. 
Mariah's response to his question is enigmatic, but in Shakespeare's time, dry could mean sexually impotent or old and withered. Thus, the implication is that Sir Andrew cannot possibly be taken seriously as a dashing, witty, virile man. A woman he has been encouraged to front, board, woo and assail is clearly prepared to hint about his lack of potency. Mariah's triumphant final line, I, sir, I have them at my finger's ends. Marry, now I let go your hand, I am barren, can be interpreted in a few, well, few ways. It could be a return to the previous joke about not holding the hand of the fool that is Sir Andrew. Alternatively, if we interpret the phrase dry jest as being a dig at Sir Andrew's virility, she could be suggesting the multiplicity and extraordinarily tragic scope of his sexual impotence when she agrees with Sir Andrew's question that she is full of them. It's very tempting to take the lines on screen, as well as the later reference in Act 3, Scene 2, in which Sir Toby admits that he has cost Sir Andrew some 2,000 strong or so, and the horrible parting shot in Act 5, Scene 1, in which Sir Toby calls Sir Andrew an asshead, and a Kotzkamp, and a knave, to conclude that Sir Toby ruthlessly uses Sir Andrew for his money, and doesn't care for him at all that his sole desire is to bleed him dry before packing him off from whence he came. I hope that this is too simplistic. In conversation with Mariah before Sir Andrew enters, Sir Toby does not openly criticise him and makes a reasonable stab of sticking up for him. When Mariah suggests that if Sir Andrew wasn't such a coward, his quarrelling would have resulted in his death by now, the noun scoundrels and subtractors, with the latter a made-up word indicating slanderers, show Sir Toby at least going through the motions of an indignant defence of a friend's. As an aside, Elizabeth Yearling, in her essay Language, Theme and Character in Twelfth Night, suggests that Sir Toby's mixture of impressive and colloquial vocabulary, including made-up words, reflects his disorder, but at the same time, a certain openness to experience. Is this analysis too kind? Returning to the dynamics between Sir Toby and Sir Andrew, there is also clear companionship between the two, at least in terms of sociable alcohol consumption. Following Mariah's triumphant exit, there seems to be a note of sympathy, and dare I say it, compassion within his question on screen now, as he hands his colleague in arms yet another glass of wine. Sir Toby is also not averse to giving out compliments, albeit ones which are rarely as positive or simple as they may first seem, or are interpreted by Sir Andrew. Towards the end of Act 1, Team 3, he compliments Sir Andrew's leg formation, thus his dancing potential. And here it initially sounds like Sir Toby is saying something nice. If Sir Andrew had studied the arts, i.e. languages and music, he would have had a great hairstyle. However, there are two points to make about this. Firstly, Sir Andrew didn't study the arts, or seemingly anything at all. So the implication is perhaps that his hairstyle is far from excellent. Secondly, it all sounds rather illogical anyway, until we pick up on Sir Toby's punning. By arts, he also means artifice, i.e. artificial things. Thus, if Sir Andrew had become an expert in artifice, this would have resulted in an adeptness in areas such as how to most effectively artificially curl one's hair. And to return to this so-called compliments, is it not just a simple means of getting Sir Andrew to prance around the stage in a ridiculous manner, dancing for his own amusement? This is certainly how it appears in the 1986 Australian production. Yet, this Sir Toby joins in with the dancing. There is mutual fun and laughter in this production, not just cruel fun at another's expense. <laughs> well... So we set about some revels. What should we do else? Let me see the caper. Higher. Dramatic irony. 
When the audience know more about a situation, the one or more of the characters on stage plays a crucial role in Twelfth Night as a whole. In Act 1, Scene 4, there are two key moments, the first of which has a comic effect. Orsino transfers the responsibility of trying to convince Olivia of his love to his new young page, Cesario, whom the audience knows is Viola in disguise. He elaborates on his belief or hope that Cesario may be more successful in his quest than his predecessor by suggesting that his more feminine appearance will increase his chances of success. Given that Cesario is indeed a woman and played by a female actress in modern times, this is likely to evoke an amused reaction from an audience. Little does Orsina know how perilously close he has come to the truth about his new page. The comedy is intensified by the fact that Orsino goes into a fair amount of detail about Cesario's feminine appearance. His lips are smooth and ruby red, with no trace of a moustache. He has a high-pitched voice, and in general, everything about him seems feminine. On stage, this is likely to produce, at the least, a blush from Cesario, or possibly a shared eek with the audience. Orsino is so wrapped up in himself that he is unlikely to be observant of anything of this kind. In John Sichel's 1970 TV adaptation, our earnest young page cannot maintain eye contact with Orsino as he comes so close to the truth, earnestly holding her shoulders and speaking from the heart. In that, believe it, for they shall yet belie thy happy years that say thou art a man. Diana's lip is not more smooth and rubious. Thy small pipe is as the maiden's organ, shrill and sound, and all is semblant of a woman's part. Note once again Orsino referring to Diana, the chaste goddess of the hunt. In Act 1, Scene 1, he referenced the moment when Actian saw Diana bathing and was turned into a deer or heart for his troubles, resulting in a rather unpleasant death at the hands of his own hounds. One would be tempted to deduce that the combination of these two references may imply that Orsino may be more attractive by virginal unattainability, perhaps in a similar way to which the trainee nun Isabella is found so enticing in Measure for Measure, rather than any human characteristics per se. So Orsino skirting incredibly close to the truth without realising it is likely to produce an easy belly laugh from the audience. However, there are other moments in the play when additional audience knowledge causes greater unease. For instance, in Act 1, Scene 3, we know that both Sir Toby and Mariah regularly toy with Sir Andrew, with Sir Toby having nakedly referred to the attractiveness of Sir Andrew's annual income. In that scene, such toying seems to be relatively harmless, with Sir Andrew ending up in great spirits, capering around the stage. However, at the end of Act 1, Scene 4, Viola's revelation in an aside that she herself loves Orsino creates a more serious feel. This woman has already gone through so much, nearly drowned at sea, presumably lost her brother, had to jettison her female attire to disguise herself as a eunuch come page in a strange new land. The rhyming couplet of Strife and Wife emphasises the obvious conflict of interest. She has to try to woo Olivia on Orsino's behalf, when, in her heart of hearts, she would love to have a go at winning Orsino for herself, something she can't even contemplate due to her current disguised state. But it's important not to overstress the seriousness. For me, this dramatic, revelatory ending to the scene is likely to result in interested gasps from the audience more than anxious anticipations of tragedy. The audience is going to be asking themselves interested questions such as, how will Viola deal with this? Surely she may be tempted at some point to hint to Orsino about her feelings, or at least not carry out his instructions too wholeheartedly, and could Orsino possibly cotton on? In later scenes, there will be darker moments, notably Act 2, Scene 4, in which Viola refers to the mythical daughter of her father, who sat like patient on a monument, smiling at grief, in which the audience's inside knowledge will make them realise that there are tragic possibilities and endings for some of these characters. 
But this is not the feeling with the more light-hearted dramatic irony presented in Act 1, Scene 4. Question 4. Who is in love with whom at the end of Act 1, Scene 4? Let's take this systematically. In Act 1, Scene 1, we learn that Orsino is in love with Olivia. However, she cannot love him with the reason given that she has to continue to mourn for her dead brother. In Act 1, Scene 3, we learn that Sir Toby has brought Sir Andrew to try to woo Olivia. After all, he is perplexed by what he sees as her over-the-top insistence on mourning, calling it a plague. And in Act 1, Scene 4, we learn that Viola, disguised as Cesario, loves Orsino. In Act 1, Scene 5, things are going to get even more complicated. The love triangle will be completed. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, encouraging you to think more closely about Act 1, Scenes 3 to 4 of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Many thanks for watching.